Okay, so next on the list is a uh, very good friend of mine. How, how many of you um, own an Apple iPhone? Just show of hands. Where do you buy it from? Apple. App Store, right. So Tim was part of a group, and he's the founder of 8 Inc. They designed the first Apple Store in America. So we're very honored to have Tim come talk to us about the future of work. I don't need this. Wow. Thanks, Calvin. Let me follow Dylan. Great. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think about 20, more than 25 years ago, I took uh, Dylan's advice and uh, tried to make a design company. So we began uh, quite a while ago. And um, I think the spirit that that Calvin is talking about here in terms of future me um, is something that that maybe has been as much a guide for us as um, as really anything that we, that we've been involved in. We've been very fortunate to work on lots of interesting things. Certainly, uh, the Apple the Apple Retail Program uh, for many years. This is our our 19th year still working uh, with Apple. But um, I think the the idea of try and that sort of spirit is something that not only we've been able to benefit from, but I think Apple's been able to benefit from. And a big part of what we attribute to that is the idea of uh, focusing on what human experience is. And this means the outcome of, wh of whatever we're making. Whether it's, it's a retail shop, whether that's um, a way of, of irrigating our, our plants, I think the idea of the, the outcome is something that fundamentally needs, needs to drive what we're doing. And, um, you know, if we look at the statistics here, it's pretty interesting to think about how much experience is, has come to the forefront, particularly in the last five years, whether it's the way executives are looking at their business, um, whether it's uh, the way that they're prioritizing it in terms of the types of things that they're focusing on. Um, whether it's uh, a big component of their digital strategy. And I think what's, what's most interesting is that when you're able to create a compelling experience and drive something emotional for people, you're able to really influence the way they interact with you. They're more likely to recommend you as, as a company or a product, and they're actually more likely to forgive a mistake. And I think that's a really, a really interesting thing. If we're able to connect with people at an emotional level, we're able to develop a much stronger relationship that has much more power in the long run. Um, we're a relatively small group of people, but uh, we tried to make one office in San Francisco. I came here six years ago to open an office in Singapore, and uh, we are now opening our, our 12th one in Dubai uh, at the moment. But we've kept the group very small and very focused on this idea of what is the human outcome. And um, we can now work 24 hours a day, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but we, what's been great is in, in trying to set up a design firm, we tried to do a really good job with one of our clients. And that's grown into now uh, you know, probably you know, a list I couldn't have imagined when I started the company. But what's best is with most of these clients, we've been working with them for many, many years. So um, I think that's also something that, that you know, focusing on, on how uh, you can sincerely uh, affect what you're doing in terms of the, the outcome of people's lives. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the idea of how we're transforming our design consultancy. Consultancy is kind of an old idea. It's been around for a long time. Um, and so on the, on the, the uh, objective of creating value, we really need to look at it as approaching it from a couple different perspectives. And we've been doing the strategic design consulting for many years, as I said, 25 years. And over the last probably six or eight years, we've been working on this idea of growing a design incubation component. And this is something that I think um, is probably the most exciting thing that we're, that we're doing these days. Um, when we work on the strategic side, you know, we, we find a lot of interesting things. Um, we find that people make distinguishing things and then turn around and deliver them in the same way as all, 
as all of their competitors. And when they do that, they're ultimately commoditizing what they have. And so we see the best, the best leaders focusing on standing out from the competition and really starting to, to separate as a way of creating value for their business. We also see that uh, word of mouth is a very important thing, but direct experience that people have with uh, your product or with your brand uh, has an incredible impact on whether or not uh, people talk about it. So it's important to think maybe what are those words you want people to say about your brand. Um, when we approach a project, we try to really become advocates for the end user. The companies that hire us think that we're working for them. We're actually working for the people that they're serving. And by, by designing the experience around these four realms, we feel we have the best chance of making, making a connection that will matter. And so, you know, it's, it's been a lot of great, great companies, a lot of great projects, uh, launching, launching products for Apple and working for Virgin as well for many years, Citibank and, and Lincoln and uh, City Private Bank, ANZ, and starting to work in some of the, the incubation projects that we're doing over the years. Um, in the end, this makes up a body of work, but uh, it, it really starts to give us a sense of, of what, we, what our potential is. And I think we're just, just starting to see that potential. Um, with the retail program, one of the things that we always use this example to talk about is the idea of risk and the idea of trying. So going, going back to Dylan's, Dylan's point, um, that, you know, when, when Steve, uh, when we opened the, f the first store, Steve was sitting on one of the tables and said, what, what if no one comes tomorrow? And he hadn't justified a lot of the retail program ar around deep research. He, he had really done it based on, on his gut. And um, so there was a certain level of anxiety. And the reason there was anxiety was everybody else was telling him what a disaster this was going to be. This is, you know, that financially it was a, it was a, a big mistake for the company. Um, but what was interesting, and particularly looking back on it today, was that it was creating a lot of noise in the system. And maybe that should be an indicator for whatever you're doing. If it's creating some noise, maybe you, know, you should do it. You, know, you should encourage, encourage making that change. It's probably something that's significant enough to have impact. And at the time they were talking about risk, they were saying, you know, Apple's putting millions of dollars into this retail program. Look at, look at the risk that, that it's uh, taking on for its shareholders. But the biggest risk was not doing the retail program. This store did a half billion dollars in sales last year. So that's the big risk. The big risk would have been listening to the pundits and not, and not following, taking that, that uh, gamble. And, and risk is proportional. Um, fortunately, you know, it, it turned, out, turned out well. Um, you know, the financial aspects and, and probably the life of the company was affected by that. But one, what I think is one of the biggest drivers is the fact that we were able to focus on the human outcome, that the experience people had in the retail program was the deepest, most meaningful connection to the Apple brand, and as a result, people loved the engagement. And because they loved the engagement, then, then the money comes. But it wasn't focused on creating the money first. It was creating that, that, that human experience that was going to ultimately uh, to help transform the company. So that, that's really the, the strategic side, but the design incubation side now is something that we're continuing to invest more and more time in and more and more uh, interest in. And one of the nice things is, um, you know, we're, we're at a, a really incredible time. We're probably at a time where uh, the greatest transformation is happening, and um, we're talking to a lot of companies, particularly today, who say, well, you know, that when that digital transformation comes, we're gonna, we're gonna be right there with it. Well, you know, it, it's, it's here, it's already, it's already done. These companies are in a completely new economy and in a completely different way of engaging. Um, and so out of that, then it's led to a number of different projects. And so we've incubated things across lots of different sectors and going into uh, technology as well as um, uh, everything from, from mobility to uh, financial services. But the big idea here is that uh, we, we come at this differently. If you look, if you look at most startups, 50% of all startups fail. Um, 
48% of all startups fail because, and it's the number one reason, they fail because they haven't solved a human need. So if, if you think of coming at a problem from a business perspective, that's one way into creating value. If you think about coming into it from a technology perspective, that's another way of creating value. We try to look at it, coming at it from the human experience, and if that's the case, we're, we're actually focused on the number, one, the number one need, which is making sure that what you're creating has value. Um, if you look at Google coming at it from technology perspective, the Google Glass is a great example. Um, you know, it, it, it was a technology-led innovation, but had no real human application other than probably as a, as a contraceptive. So when you, think, when you think about this approach, it actually helps us find, find space that helps to transform um, what, we, what we do into, an, into a new form. Uh, the strategic design piece, it's, it's very helpful because it gives us insights, insights we wouldn't necessarily have because we work a lot across lots of different categories and industries. Those insights combined with uh, the human-focused idea generation um, allows us some unique opportunities. We, we, we say we like to see the, you know, see the moisture before the clouds are forming. We see where Apple's placing bets, we see where Virgin's placing bets, we see where Citibank's placing bets. They tend to look in their verticals and we see all the space in between. And so from that perspective, if, if we multiply this out, we think there's a, a much higher opportunity for success, both in terms of creating something that's meaningful, but also in terms of generating uh, business value. So we take these different prospects and what Aid has done is I've, I've consolidate our, our resources across the company into an incubation fund. We choose one a year and we, we launch it into the, um, into the atmosphere. Um, we incubate it from a design perspective and from a human outcome perspective to the point to where we can prove the concept. At that point, we look at whether or not it's justified as a new business by whether or not there are people who see that idea and want to join. And so we bring people, friends, colleagues, people that we have experience with in different categories into the conversation and at that point make them partners in the company. And, and we start it and we grow from, grow from there. And so building, building out from the incubation idea ultimately into, into a, a, a company that's a spin out. These are the types of things uh, that, that we've been working on. Um, and some of, the, some of the stuff that's in the pipeline. But we're looking at scaling that pipeline even more uh, these days because of the success that, that we've been having. And I think one of the, one of the key things for, for us is we recognize that an idea is not an innovation. Um, you know, everyone can have ideas. It actually takes hard work to get to a point where that idea turns into something that's meaningful for people. And the way you know it is, is whether others adopt it. You can't, you can't force it. It has to be something that people recognize and, and uh, are attracted to as value. Um, you know, most of these companies weren't the first ones into, that, into their category. And the difference was uh, the way it was designed. So we always talk about how you do it matters, that, that you understand that the difference between Facebook and MySpace was really about adoption. And that adoption came through uh, the design, the execution, and ultimately the outcome that it, that it had for people. Um, we've been work, working with a lot of really interesting people, but one of the unusual threads here is that every, everybody shares uh, this idea of what the, what the human outcome is as the core component when they approach a project and when they, when they look at a new project. Um, and we've seen this over and over with people who, who have been able to create successful business, but also people um, who we remember, who we respect uh, for what they do. And for this, this type of uh, approach, I think it's something that hopefully uh, we can share today and uh, it helps, helps to lead us into the next great, great thing that we're making. And so for us, it always comes back to what, what is the human experience that we're working on. Um, ultimately, all design is about change, and all change is about improvement, and that's, that's really why we should be doing any of these things. Anyway, thank you. So uh, just before we let Tim go, just a 
quick question then. He's worked with some of the best people around the world, and, and we have parents with their kids here. What, what can, not in front of the speaker. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you look for in an employee? What are, the, what are the things you look for just f to help the parents out? So yeah. when the kids grow up, what should you send your kids to do? Pure science, et cetera, et cetera. Or let's listen to what Tim has to say about that. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if I look at, at any of those people in, on those images, the things that they shared is probably uh, the fact that um, they had a, a strong capability in both right and left brain functions. Um, one of the greatest things of working with Steve was um, he, he could drive you crazy because he was very analytical at one moment. If the analytics worked, then he would switch over and be completely uh, intuitive. And so, you know, if you tried to solve for just the rational, you may or may not be successful, but even if you were, you maybe would miss on the, on the more emotional side. So I think, you know, that, that balance of development, I think, you know, it's commonly referred to as emotional intelligence, having an understanding of the sciences, but also understanding the humanities. Um, some people call that T-shaped learners. I think it's people who are curious and lifelong learners and, uh, understand how things fit together. The world's a much more complex place than it used to be. We used to educate sort of for the industrial revolution type of model. Today, the world is not that. And um, so I'm always looking for, for people who demonstrate, you know, intelligence, sensitivity, um, and uh, a desire to continue to learn. Thank you very much. Yeah.